today's session with the experts. And the moderator for this year's Q&A with the experts is my good friend and both heads, uh, conference met team member, Ed Reagan. Ed retired uh, as very executive, uh, very executive human resources for Mobile uh, Oil Corporation in 1996. He discovered the Boulder Heads in 2001, and he and his wife Patty attended their first Boulder Head conference in uh, Denver in May 2004. They've been, they've both been active in the Boulder Heads uh, ever since that time, and they were the local area coordinators for our Washington, D.C. Uh, Boulder Heads conference. They live in Northern Virginia, and started the Washington, D.C. local area chapter, local area chapter. It has a BS in business and a master's in organizational development. Please welcome Ed to the stage. I was certainly glad that now had Martin Jackson's last year. <laughs> that was my first opportunity to get up here. And uh, so this year, I'm honored to uh, be hosting this portion of the program. I've got some questions that have come from the attendees here today, so I'm going to give those first crack. And there's no particular order and no, uh, no priority here. They're just the way they fall on my desk. Before I do that, I want to introduce the members of the panel. Uh, to my left is Rick Ferry. Uh, he's founder and managing partner of the Low Cost Investment Management Firm Portfolio Solutions. He's the author of six investment related books, a Forbes.com columnist, and a Wall Street Journal expert contributor. Please welcome Rick Ferry. Next to Rick is Bill Bernstein, who was here at the prior uh, session. Uh, but he's founder of Efficient Frontier Advisors, author of several successful titles on finance and economic history. Please provide a real welcome to a Bill favorite, Bill Bernstein. <laughs> Next to him is Alan Roth, who's the founder of Roth Logic. He's an author and an AALP columnist. Please welcome Alan Roth. <laughs> and last but not least, uh, is a Colorado, Colorado licensed CPA and the author of the blog Oblivious Investor. He's authored a number of very successful digital books. Please welcome Mike Piper. Mike, by the way, he wants everyone to know this is one of three days a year he wears a tie. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the first question here, uh, this is from Bob Roman. Uh, the question is, for investors who can deal with the liquidity issues, what do you think about using private equity for a 10 to 20% component? of a diversified investment portfolio, and that's open to the group. Who am I running the private equity? Yeah. Uh, when it gets to private equity, the biggest consideration, if you're going to do that, is who is running the fund and the credibility of the people that are running the fund. And do you know them personally, although I think people who knew Bernie Madoff personally, that didn't work out so well. <laughs> but um, um, I think if you have enough money and you wanted to put some money in private equity, that if things work out well for you, you might get the same return as a small cap value index fund. Or you could just buy a small cap value index fund. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, I consider private equity to be any private investment that I make, and that's not an efficient market. But when you think of a private equity fund, the, the market 
it may not be purely efficient, but you know, the, the typical model is 2 and 20, meaning it's a 2% expense ratio and 20% of the upside. And I've never seen any manager compelling enough that I would invest. Alan, uh, would you explain what you mean by the efficiency the market being efficient or not? Um, in, in a purely efficient market, you know, one can't add any value. And I think that there are enough people looking whether Exxon, um, Apple, Walmart are under or overvalued. But in a private deal, you know, buying a, an investment condo is, in my opinion, a private equity deal. There aren't thousands of people looking at it. Markets are efficient, not perfectly efficient. Even, you know, public equity markets aren't perfectly efficient. Okay, next question. This is for Dr. Bernstein. I have been value averaging for the last nine years. It seems like this technique is poorly adopted. I'm feeling a bit lonely. <laughs> what are your current thoughts on value averaging? And that's from Patrick Chubb. Well, value averaging uh, is basically nothing more and nothing less than a combination of dollar cost averaging uh, and rebalancing. Okay, so I think it's slightly advantaged with respect to dollar cost averaging as long as you have the liquidity to execute it when it tells you to buy a whole lot of stock when the market is down. Value averaging has done very, pretty well over the past nine years because you got to buy through the 08, 09, 010, 011 market. So you bought it fairly good prices. That's a that's about the best case scenario. The worst case scenario for dollar for, for value averaging and dollar cost averaging is a just a gradually rising market. It is almost all the time inferior to lump sum investing, but the trick is that most people don't have that option. They're saving continuously and they don't have this enormous sum of money they only acquire uh, through periodic uh, saving. So, you know, for, for someone who is uh, periodically saving, who has a, a 401k plan, I think it's a fine uh, technique for deploying your assets. Okay, the next question is from Phil Evenson. Is it a myth that international funds need active management because local knowledge is needed for the markets that is not needed for the U.S.? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> there's no evidence to support that. Um, that is what we hear when active managers outperform in the international side because normally active managers outperform when the market itself does poorly relative to other markets. So internationally has done poorly relative to the U.S. Hence, international managers seem to have outperformed, but. Uh, the fact is that uh, the data over the long term doesn't show that active management in international outperforms the correct benchmark. And I think that what we have here in many ways is we have the wrong benchmark being used, like the EFI, for example, which is not a great, it, it was okay when it was developed, but not really a great benchmark for active management. Probably a better benchmark for active management is a total. Uh, international index X US. So we would have emerging markets in there, we'd have Canada in there, uh, which is not in the EFI index. So um, I think that one of the problems is that the active managers will try to measure their performance against a bad benchmark. And when you actually use a one that they is covers the entire world, X US, you find out that it just doesn't doesn't unfold that way in the numbers. I, think, I wish Christine were here, but if you look at Morningstar uh, on the Vanguard Total International, whether it's the ETF or um, mutual fund, you'll see that over the last five years it's performed below average. And how can indexing will be below average? Well, the answer, and I did a little research, I'm going to write about it. Um, you know, Vanguard did this research for me. What they showed is that the average um, international fund had a much lower exposure to emerging markets. And emerging markets over the last five years has, has been a drag. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, you go out longer and come to the conclusion 
that anyone who makes that statement should be required to with a big sandwich board that says, I haven't looked at the data, I haven't even logged on to Morningstar. The argument for active investing internationally is that the markets might be less efficient, so there are more opportunities to find stocks that are undervalued, or get out of stocks that are overvalued, things of that nature. And so there we're talking about the efficient market hypothesis, but Jack always talks about the costs matters hypothesis, which is that the higher the costs are <coughs> of a group, uh, so active managers, by definition, active funds are going to have a higher average cost than passive funds. So by definition, after expenses, on average, they're going to perform worse. That's the cost matters hypothesis, and it applies just as well to international as it does to U.S., just like bonds, just like everything else. Active will be passive when subtraction no longer works. We don't even need all <laughs> 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 uh, I will say one thing about this active versus passive debate, if you don't mind me throwing this in. Oh. Okay, so, uh, you know, I was at a uh, ETF conference in Chicago. In fact, it was a Morningstar ETF conference a couple of weeks ago, and Goldman Sachs announced their new series of actively managed ETFs uh, that follow active beta. Active beta. You know, we heard of smart beta, enhanced beta, blah, 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 blah. Now we have active beta. Anyway, so it's all this factor-based investing, and we can get into factor-based investing uh, questions if we have them. But, but here was the thing about the Goldman Sachs funds. Nine basis points. What they said was they wanted to take pricing off the table on the active versus passive debate. And they were bringing these active funds, and they are active funds, down to indexing levels so that they can show that their strategies actually outperform uh, on a net basis. Uh, so we will see. I mean, you know, if that's the new thing now, active management is going to cost less than or equal to indexing, then all things being equal, that should level the playing field, but it doesn't make active managers out the form because it's still a zero sum game. Rick, Rick, if Goldman Sachs is willing to earn nine basis points, don't their profits completely disappear? No, because they have such good products. <laughs> the value of these shares are going to explode and people are going to pile billions of dollars in. Goldman Sachs only cares about their clients. <laughs> For the clients. And, and I'm trademarking brilliant beta, which is smarter than smart beta. <laughs> okay, the next question. Uh, this is from Mel Turner. Assume that money is not needed for living expenses and can remain invested for this question. Are there any strategies for receiving required minimum distribution? Is it best the first of the year, end of the year, monthly? Sure. Um, the longer you wait, the better, as long as you don't forget. Uh, <laughs> generally, uh, generally speaking, the longer you can keep your money in a tax advantaged account, tax advantaged account, the better it is. That's just a bit. Um, now. Yeah, we'll leave it at that. That would be my answer. <laughs> there are pros and cons, but a QLAC, qualified, what does it say? Longevity annuity. Longevity annuity contract is a way to get up to $125,000 out of your IRA um, and into a deferred product, and you're essentially buying longevity insurance. It comes with a cost, and it has some problems with it, but that's one idea. It won't stop you from having to take RMDs. It will just make your RMDs somewhat smaller. Um, but no, and this, is, this is exactly what Alan was getting at, saying that it has drawbacks, is that um, a QLAC can be a way to minimize your RMDs, or rather reduce them. But it only makes sense if you want to buy a deferred annuity in the first place. It doesn't make sense purely as a tax planning tool, if you have no use for a deferred annuity. <coughs> No, I, 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 I talked with uh, Mel about this. Tom Mel. Yeah, next. And um, I think he has the right answer, and that is that when you need the money, you take it. Because uh, if you need it for, as Mel was saying, you need to uh, 
pay taxes in April, well, you take it in March. You need it for, as he was saying, Christmas presents in December, well, you take it in November. But don't forget to take it. Like Mike said, you're really going to be in trouble. So I think the, from a tax perspective, whether you take it early in the year or later in the year, or you take it every single month, ends up being de minimis. Would you agree with that, Mike? De minimis? Yes. Yeah. yeah, not one of the most important factors in retirement. Yeah, so you just take it when it's best for you to get that cash flow. That would be my You don't ever want to take tax advice from me. Uh, <laughs> but it would seem to me you could almost make the opposite argument that on average the return on the stock market is positive. Right? So if you take it on the first of the year, on average you'll be taking less than all at the uh, ordinary income rate and you'll be getting that growth for the ensuing year at the long-term capital gains rate. So you could make the opposite argument. Oh, but I could make an opposite argument to that. <laughs> <laughs> and that is it depends what you do with the money. Because if you take it out at the beginning of the year, you could put it into an account uh, where it, just an, an equity account, and it grows after tax for, uh, well, until you have to make your tax payment. If you make quarterly tax payments, you have to start paying. So, um, you know, it depends what you do with the money. If you spend it, you're right. If you invest it, it might the opposite might actually happen. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to stick with taking it at the end of the year. <laughs> if you if you're making the argument that taking it out at the beginning of the year, you can then invest it in a taxable account, and equities have tax advantage characteristics in a taxable account. Well then, why just take out your RMD? Why not take out everything, or, or a lot? Why not take out until the top of your tax bracket and just do that every year? But we don't talk about doing that. And that's because the growth, while it's in the account, is tax-free, even if it's a tax-deferred account. You're not paying tax on the growth along the way. And that's, it's an unusual distinction, but that's why, that's why tax-deferred investing makes sense in the first place, really. I'm sticking with Mike and that it's really de minimis. It doesn't matter much. It's not one of the top thousand things yeah. that's <laughs> that I worry about. And there was a perfect example of Taylor's favorite quote. There are many roads to go. <laughs> so the next question is from uh, Paul Stratton. Please explain the global man volatility fund. It appears to be a global, a global dividend growth fund with currency hedging. Is this a Vanguard fund? I don't know if all of this is a Vanguard fund. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I haven't studied it, so I'm going to pass it. Have you studied this fund? No. I, I'm certainly not an expert on it. You know, I've looked at the Vanguard fund. It's done fairly well. I spoke to John Emmerich uh, yesterday over at Vanguard. Um, I'm, I think there's some good logic to it. But when ever some, you know, so many firms were launching the same type of fund um, and money flows into what has been hot. I worry about it, so I, I'm not a fan of it. Yeah, I mean, I, I always worry, who are my fellow shareholders? Are they smart money or are they dumb money? And I think what is happening increasingly is that smart data is meeting the dumb money. <laughs> okay, the next question is from uh, Karen Bennett. Uh, this is for everyone, if you care to share it. Um, two part question. What is your personal asset allocation and why? What drives that allocation? And the second part is, do you take special security precautions with your financial accounts, i.e. unique passwords, frequency of changing passwords? Oh, well, my asset allocation is 80% equity, 20% 20% fixed income, and the fixed income portion is more of an emergency fund, and it's mostly invested in the uh, Vanguard Total Stock Market uh, um, ETF, actually. Sorry, Jack. <laughs> it's only because I'm at a brokerage firm, so I, I have to use ETFs as opposed to open-end funds because it's more costly to, to trade open-end funds, even Admiral shares at a mutual fund company, than an ETF. So you get the same, same thing, only you, you trade it or you buy it cheaper. Uh, using ETFs as a commission. But anyway, um, so as Jack was saying, it's an operational issue. The, uh, and then the, the Vanguard Total International 
I also have a, a DFA small value fund. Um, but um, you know, I, I'm going to get a, a military pension, so I'm, I, I, you know, I'm going to get my Social Security uh, and so forth, and my wife will get Social Security. So pretty much my expenses when I retire will be covered by my military pension, Social Security, and uh, I won't have to withdraw much money from my retirement account, so I can be more aggressive. So it, it, it depends on what else you have. You can't just look at the asset allocation. Yeah. I, I would agree with that. I mean, I'm 40, 60, uh, because the 60 is what I'll need to retire on with a very generous margin of error. The 40% really isn't my money. I'm um, just renting it. Uh, and, and, you know, I'm a big believer, as you all know, when, when you won the game, you, you stop playing. Also, my form is pretty darn aggressive. Uh, it's, it's, it's familiar work. Closer to, to, I guess, what is referred to locally as the Lowry portfolio, which I'm not as enthusiastic about as I was 10 or 20 years ago, but I still think it's a, not a bad idea. I'm 45, 55. Of my 45, 30 percentage points are in the U.S., and sorry, Jack, 15 percent international. Um, my core holdings, I've made mistakes, including my first S&P 500 index fund was a Dreyfus um, index fund. Um, and of my 55% fixed income, I, I have an incredibly tiny pension. Uh, roughly 70 percentage points are in CDs and the 30% in bond funds, of which total bond and uh, inflation protected would be the cores. And then I've recently started playing with uh, a little bit of brokered uh, CDs buying on the secondary market where a couple of weeks ago you could get a 3.2% um, return on a CD that had maybe 2.75 years remaining. Um, Ed was talking about Taylor's favorite quote, there are many roads to Dublin. I always like his other favorite quote, which is the majesty of simplicity. Um, my portfolio is 100% Vanguard Life Strategy Growth Fund. That's it. Oh, and, um, the, the other question about security. I just tried to use a complex password, and I use two-factor authentication, so no one can log into my account without my phone. And he would know because he's under 50. <laughs> <laughs> can you teach me how to do that? He lives a mile from me now. <laughs> Uh, now, these questions are coming from questions submitted on the COVID-19.org. And uh, so the first question uh, for the panelists is, Vanguard introduced total international taxable bond funds ETFs, which are currency hedged. How do hedged international bonds fit into a retirement portfolio? I would say not at all. <laughs> because, because, as Jack's pointed out, the yields are very uh, low. But basically, you know, a hedged um, sovereign uh, fixed income fund, foreign income fund, it goes almost identically to a U.S. one. And so, you know, you've got higher expenses. It's this pretty much the same performance. The diversification there you get out of it is minimal. Why are you even bother? I'm incredibly agnostic about it. Um, if you look at the four asset classes, U.S. stocks, uh, international stocks, U.S. bonds, or international bonds, it's the single largest asset class. So there's an argument to hold some of it. But when you look at the total fees in hedging, and I, I strongly believe if you're going to own international bonds, they ought to be hedged to U.S. dollar if you live here in the U.S., not so for stocks, but for bonds. Um, so it's the extra fees. It's done incredibly well. Its yields, I believe, are down to 0.99%. I think Brand Kinnery looked at that yesterday when we were talking. Um, so I, I don't think it's going to make or break a, a portfolio. So I would say agnostic. But the fees at 0.25%, including the hedging, are much more expensive than total bond. I mean, one other fast thing, which is that this is very small potatoes. I mean, they were a lot as part of some of the life cycle funds. That's not a reason not to own them. It's too yeah, they not a reason not to own them. Yeah, but what's I would still own the life, the life cycle funds or the target retirement funds. Uh, in 
spite of the fact that they went international law. It's just not that much of a drag. I'm in heated agreement with Bill. Yeah, but that's where I am with my own portfolio. If I was using a DIY allocation, frankly, I probably would not have included international bonds. But I'm using a life strategy fund. Vanguard put them in there. It doesn't really bother me. I'm okay with that. And I'm going to be incredibly cynical. <laughs> I think that Vanguard put the international bond fund in the life strategy fund because they needed to fund that fund. That's my opinion. Uh, I'm with Bill, by the way, in the rest of the panel. I don't think we do need international bonds. I don't own them, I never did, but um, I've done the research, it's in my book, I, I don't see a purpose. It doesn't do anything for the portfolio, and it does cost more with the hedging overlay uh, than U.S. bonds, so I'm not. Again, if you do it because you believe in it, fine. I mean, it's so de minimis again, whether you have it or don't have it, it's fine, but uh, I don't see a purpose. Okay, the next question is short and sweet. Uh, REITs, are they still an effective diversifier? Short term, no. Uh, they're, they're, a, they're a risky asset. And, you know, when the bad stuff gets the ventilating system, uh, you know, all, all risky assets go down. REITs will do that too. In the long run, uh, I think they do provide some diversification. Uh, they've gotten to be a little cheaper. I think mean, their yields are up somewhere more than four percent now, uh, so they're not a bad uh, asset asset class in terms of valuation. They're not they're not great. Um, but you know, you hold them for periods like you know uh, 2000 to 2005. Uh, they got nailed in 2002 over that five year period. The return was much higher than the S and P 500. It's the, True of all risky asset classes, they don't help you at all in terms of risk uh, uh, reduction in the short term or the long term. They can be a real value. I think I, I own REITs and often I, I recommend them. I mean, REITs did very well during the dot com bubble, not so well, obviously, during the real estate bubble. Um, you know, the total stock index fund owns. Reads. So therefore, am I overweighting it? The answer is relative to the stock market, yes, but most real estate is not owned by the public market. So, you know, I, I have some REITs and I rebalance when they've done well. I'm selling when they haven't done well. I'm buying. I wrote an article a couple of years ago called the Total Economy Portfolio. Total Economy Portfolio. And uh, it got published in Forbes and a few other places. And what I did was I took uh, corporate income and rents, so you're looking at GDP data, and I said, where does the economy earn money? How, how is money earned in the economy? And I stripped out um, individual pay and so forth, uh, and uh, tried to come up with what an asset allocation of the economy would be, as opposed to the industries and the asset allocation of the industries that make up the stock market. Because the stock market is made up of corporate board decisions. They decide whether they're going to capitalize using stocks or debt or private equity. And so those are corporate board decisions. And then the uh, investors decide what the valuation of those are. So there's a lot of industries out there that traditionally are not capitalized using equity. They traditionally capitalized using uh, private equity or, or using debt. And real estate is certainly one of them. So when you look at the total economy and you say, if I created an asset allocation of industries based on the economy as opposed to the stock market, then you would actually have an allocation of about 10% to a REIT index fund. And, uh, and that's one argument for it. So if you want your portfolio, portfolio to look more like the economy than the stock market, then you might add more REITs. And also what Bill says, in the long term, the correlation between REITs and the stock market fluctuates. Sometimes it's high, sometimes it's low. And the correlation between REITs and the returns from bonds or interest rates, also the correlations fluctuate. Sometimes it's positive, sometimes it's negative. So there is a diversification benefit to having a slice in REITs. And you could add, I figured this out one time, they just wrote an article about it a couple of months ago, I know maybe it was a year ago, I'm losing, I'm losing perspective these days. Um, added about 10 to 15 basis points, long-term return to your portfolio 
by having a 10% slice in a, REIT, in a REIT index fund, low cost REIT in, equity index fund, uh, REIT index for uh, commercial, what, what am I looking for? Because there are, there are mortgage REITs, there are hybrids, and then there are equity REITs. So it's yeah. equity, because Vanguard, Vanguard's REIT is all equity REITs. And so uh, I agree with Bill that there is a long term benefit to it. There's also uh, a benefit to it if you are looking at your portfolio. Uh, based on what the economy is as opposed to what the stock market is. So I'm, I'm in agreement. Avoid private reads, except for the ones I need to sell. But oh, I yeah, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> I think I read an article today that four more Wall Street firms now are, are, they're going, are being going after by the SEC for selling private reads. I mean, that's a bad one. Yeah, I mean, I, I get one finance journal out of purely brilliant interest. Uh, and that's invested in news. It's just filled with guys in three thousand dollar shoots and no necks. Uh, and and the guy who was on their front cover for doing deals just about every single week for the past year is a guy named Nick Shortch, who will surely be wearing our jersey. <laughs> uh, he did a lot of private real estate. Deals. Uh, thank you. Did a lot of writing ideas and investment news. So thank you. <laughs> Next question is for Mike Piper. Um, what do you see as the likelihood of social security means testing being adopted? Does the potential for means testing change claiming strategies? For example, if current recipients are unlikely to be subject to any such rules, is that a factor to consider in deciding to defer payment until age 70? Wow, a lot going on there. Um, the likelihood of some sort of means testing, it's already, you can make an argument that it's means tested in a variety of ways, uh, including the way it's taxed right now. Um, so additional means testing certainly doesn't seem out of the question. Um, how that should play a role in claiming strategies is a tricky question because there will be a lot of ways to means test social security, a lot of different ways. We could just change the way it's taxed to further means tested. We could change the calculation of benefits in the first place, the bend point formula, if you're familiar with that. It sounds like the person who asked the question is likely familiar with it. Um, to make it so that the higher your income was over the course of your career, the less benefits you get, in which case that wouldn't really change the claiming strategy. Um, but there's a lot of ways that it could be implemented that would change the claiming strategy. So really, Given that we don't know what's going to happen and we don't know what means testing would look like, much less whether it necessarily will happen, I wouldn't make it a major factor in your planning right now. I, I would agree with that. This is the kind of statement that only a registered Democrat would make. But the good news is that if you don't need the money, uh, you're probably, it's probably not going to matter if it gets mean tested. If you do need the money, you're not going to be affected. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next question. Uh, I'm curious if the panelists have any specific advice for long term travelers, e.g., six weeks or longer. It used to be sell in May and go away, but with the availability of the round the clock, around the globe internet access, is there anything one still should do? Don't take your own account of the cell phone. <laughs> Make sure your passport's up to date. <laughs> uh, and I also have to tell you, there's a little card that you can get now, which I have in my wallet. I don't know if you've seen this or not, but uh, I'll pull it out. Yeah, uh, here it is. Um, this little card. If you fly into Canada, this is no good. You can't get on a plane with this, which I found out when I was trying to fly into Canada about three months ago to go to a conference. I ended up having to fly to Detroit and drive into Canada because this car is no good if you're going into Canada. You're flying it. You can take a boat. You can walk. You can take a car. You can take one car. Oh, it is called a, it's called a passport card. And when I got my passport, I, I signed up for this because I said, well, I, I'm in Detroit a lot and, and I need to go to Canada once in a while so I can just use this. But I have to be at the airport and I, need, I was flying to Canada from Kansas City somewhere, wherever I was. And uh, they said, okay, we need your passport. And I said, oh, I pulled out this proud card. Now, hey, here you go. And they said, no, 
not going to work. You need a passport. And uh, I said, well, what are you talking about? And they said, well, look on the back. And it helped to say, uh, this is good for, um, uh, it talks about all the different ways in which you can get in. I must be looking at the wrong thing. But airplane was not it. You can't land in Canada with this, but you can get in any other way. So I'm just warning you, if you don't go to Canada, don't use this card. <laughs> That's my, that's my travel trip. <laughs> okay. That's what's the source of the <laughs> What about the panel's view on factor investing? At what level of increased fee does factor investing become no longer a value added to portfolio performance? That's a great question. Anybody have the answer? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, you know, if you're lucky and you average together, you know, if you have heavy factor exposure, maybe a percent of extra return. So, you know, you use that as your, your guide. I mean, certainly no more than 50 basis points. Extra preferably no more than 20 or 30. Just heard a couple of attendees ask, what is factor investing? Oh, I can hear yeah. uh, Okay. All right, factor investing. 101. <laughs> You have the whole market, the entire U.S. total stock market. But then within the market, you can start dividing out groups like small cap versus large cap, value versus growth. And then you can start comparing the risk and return of small versus large, value versus growth. And we find out that historically, value has outperformed growth. Now, why has it outperformed growth? is a different story, and I'll get to that, or maybe Bill can talk about it, because he knows and I don't. But the, I, I laid you up for that one. <laughs> but, but uh, so you say, well, if value outperforms growth, then if I put value in my portfolio, then I should outperform the market, and historically that has been correct. So the premium by which it outperforms the market is called a risk premium, because the idea, which Bill will explain, is that <laughs> being in value stocks is actually more risky than being in growth stocks. As strange as that sounds, but that's the Farmer French belief. Therefore, you should get paid more if you're in value stocks than being in growth stocks. And the difference is a risk premium for being in value. So now if you have the total market and you're going to take a value tilt, if you will, you're going to put some in value. The question is, what is the extra return that you should get from that value exposure over the market? And then how much of this factor, this risk factor, should you add to your beta or total market portfolio? That's really the question. And the question becomes, is that risk premium that you get from value going to be high enough going forward to pay the extra fee that you have to pay to be in value because value investing is always more expensive than beta because beta is basically almost free. So go ahead, Bill. <laughs> All right. I'll try and give you the box top version, which is that you know there's a there's a value factor uh, which is about five percent, which sounds really great. All right, and it's pretty much everywhere you look, every country, every time period. Um, and so that's the final French factor, which is value minus growth. So for starters, it's a long short portfolio. So the best of all worlds, they're going to get about half of that, which is two and a half percent. And that's nobody else knows about it. Uh, uh, because nobody else knew about it, you know, when Father French, Father um, French wrote about it. Uh, and so what is it now that everybody and his dog, Jack, Jack, that phrase last year is investing in it, it's going to be less than two and a half percent. That's what it's been historically with the margin of the market. And I think it's going to be less whether it's zero or whether it's one percent. It's certainly not going to be much greater than than one percent. Why is it there? Well, I think it's a two part story. As Rick said, this is this part of it, which is that value just doesn't do poorly in the United States of the world, it does even worse. Uh, so 29 32. Uh, 07 to 09, um, value stocks did much worse than uh, the market. 50, 65% down versus 55%. That doesn't sound terrible, but it's the difference between left being, left being left with 35 cents or 35 cents on the dollar at the bottom. There's also a behavioral component. People do overpay uh, for corporate stocks, and they probably always will. So I'm not as enthusiastic about it as I used to be. Uh, 
that gets to the value portfolio, which is, is basically all small value in the vertical data. So we get 30, 70 portfolio, but the 30 is all small value. And that's basically equal to the market return, the S&P 500 return uh, over the past uh, 30 or 40 years. It's not going to work that well going forward for two reasons. Number one is because that 70% value put in there was, was five year bonds, five year treasuries, and nobody invests in those, not even at the FA. Um, and, and they're not going to do that well going forward. And then the other reason is because you know, the value premium eat what it used to be. I just wrote a profile on Dimensional Fund Advisors, DFA, and there are core two factors. They have more factors now, with not only value, but small cap. And, you know, DFA is one of the good guys. I just don't think they're really banging our good. When I ask them the question, do they, do they think the premium from small cap and value is a free lunch or compensation for taking on more risk? You know, they quickly reply, compensation for taking on more risk. So my question to them was, if you were going to have, let's say, a 60-40 portfolio of the DFA small cap value tilt, wouldn't it be more efficient to buy a market cap tilt of equivalent risk at, let's say, 65-35, you'd have far lower, you'd have the same amount of risk, far lower cost, and much greater tax efficiency? They didn't answer that <laughs> Um, there's a thing called factor crowding. You can Google it, Google it, factor crowding. And what it simply means is there's so much money going into these strategies now. It, it's going to dim diminish, like Bill was saying, diminish the returns. And you have, you have this premium now that needs to be spread around many more people. I was at an ETF conference uh, a few weeks ago in Chicago. And uh, Ben Johnson, the head of their ETF research, uh, put up a slide that showed that 31% of all money going into ETFs right now are going into these factor funds. That's billions of dollars a year going into factor funds. It's going to dilute, uh, it's going to dilute uh, you know, the returns against them. And so, um, as Bill was saying, I don't know what the returns of being in, in a, a value fund going forward is. Uh, I'm guessing maybe if you put 20 or 30 percent of your portfolio in value or small cap value, even to try to get a little bump more, uh, you might end up making 25 or 30 basis points extra return in your portfolio over the long term, or you may not. And I really don't know what the answer is. Yeah, uh, I mean that's what I meant when I said you know the, the, the smart beta is meeting the dumb money. Uh, what is going to happen is the people who were sold these funds by the Morgan Stanley broker uh, are going to be calling up that broker, yelling, screaming, sell during the next bloodbath, and this asset class, because of that, will will probably have a significant negative premium, which will set up set them up for higher risk-based returns in the future. And the smart rate is not a bad year. Five years. Yeah. Five years. Yeah, I admit I'm fairly cynical about the entire concept. Um, a couple of decades ago when you know Jack and Rick were some of the first people writing about passive investing, it was countercultural almost. It was most people weren't doing it. These days the conventional wisdom is that passive investing is the way to go. Passive investing beats active. That's the conventional wisdom. So if you're launching a new fund, you need to you know, get on that bandwagon, you need to be able to say, oh, it's a passive fund. But unfortunately, you can't make a lot of money by trying to be Vanguard in the low-cost, you know, low-cost boring index fund game. They're so good at it, that it's just not a way to make money. So you need to come up with something that sounds like it's passive, but can still make you some good money. And I really get the impression that that's a large part of what's going on over the last several years with the explosion of Smart Beta and other similarly so I'm going to steal a, a joke that you'll hear Joel Dixon say tonight. And when, you, when, he, when he says it, everybody goes, ah, we've heard that before. Okay, but it came from Joel, so he gave me credit for it. He said he went to a Halloween party last week. And, and I know this because I was on a panel with Joel a couple weeks ago. He said he went to a Halloween party last week, and all of the active fund managers came up dressed as index funds. <laughs> I thought it was great. So when he says it tonight, just go ahead and laugh. <laughs> okay, 
Dave, this is a question for Alan Roth. Uh, we always discuss the stock bond mix for planning for retirement. What about for a short to provide in, say, 10 to 15 years in a taxable account? Money that you can grow use years before retirement. I'm sorry, could you repeat yeah, that? It's, it's asking what, what would be a good mix for stocks bond for shorter periods than for planning for retirement. I think, I don't know how to answer that. I think you have to look at your entire life and, and pick an asset allocation that, you know, maximizes the probability that you're not going to run out of money. Uh, I think people are chasing income, which is a mistake, the same mistake that people made back in 2008, 2009. But I don't look at, here's a pot of money that you're going to need for 10 years, here's a pot of money for 20 years, etc. It, it does kind of help mentally to, you know, one bucket of money that I'm not going to run out and you can put that in CDs with these yearly withdrawal penalties. Um, but I used to think that picking the right asset allocation was the most important decision. I've changed my mind. Sticking to whatever you pick is, is even more important. Yeah, I mean, the way I do, you know, another way of putting that would simply be a say, you're not going to be saving a lot of money when your kids are in college. <laughs> okay, uh, next question. Uh, do buy and hold investors of funds like Vanguard Total Bond Market Index, that is to say, investment grade core bond funds, need to worry about the emerging issues of bond liquidity and possible runs on mutual funds? And then he goes on to say, these concerns seem to be real, are leading the SEC to propose exit fees and their swing pricing for bond funds. No, Vanguard has to make a, a market. They have to come up with their NAV of a bond fund every single night. And those who want to get out uh, will get out at the NAV, and those who want to buy will buy at the NAV. So there's no liquidity problem uh, for uh, Vanguard total bond market holders. Now, within the fund itself, are there going to be individual liquidity issues for some bonds? Individual bonds within that fund, perhaps, but you don't have to worry about that. Uh, Vanguard, they're, they're by charter, have to make a, have to make a market at the, uh, at the end of the day, and they have to come up with an AV, which is a fair split between the buyer, you know, the buyers and sellers, and come up with a price on which you're going to sell your shares and somebody else is going to buy it. And you don't, you don't have to worry about not having that. I'd be a little worried, not so much on a total bond fund, but a junk bond fund, where some of the bonds are very illiquid, can have large spreads. Um, total bond fund is treasury and investment grade, and the spreads are typically fairly small. So if there were a panic, Vanguard could probably sell those bonds at a relatively you know, thin margin. Um, I actually was a little more worried about the, um, the PIMCO total return because they're in everything from investment grade to junk, and then as people bail with the divorce with Bill Gross and the end of performance, uh, I actually thought their end of performance would be a little larger than it has been, although I do believe over the last year it's underperformed total bond. Yeah, I mean, you know, the other issue is municipal bonds. The median municipal bond trades less than once per year. So at the trading level, is there is an issue. Those of us who held the uh, the Vanguard uni bonds funds, which were very high grade through the crisis, saw that liquidity uh, saw that liquidity problem. There were significant NAV uh, falls that had nothing to do with the intrinsic creditworthiness of the issuers. Yeah, the largest mini bond spread I've seen was 10.25 percent, and the client, believe it or not, was an attorney with the SEC. <laughs> Okay, this is a question for uh, Rick and Alan. Uh, with current devaluation and increasing public debt across all countries, is it still safe to have all the investable assets in dollars, safe to invest everything in U.S. companies? The question is primarily on currency impacts on assets due to increasing deficit and each country trying to lower the rate. Race to the bottom question. Um, I'm going to answer part of it. I'll let Alan take the rest. Notice how I. I've learned that from Bill, by the way, from being up here many, many years, and Bill saying, 
I think Rick would do it. <laughs> so we're going to think we work for him. <laughs> uh, but uh, I think that the and it gives me, gives me a chance to talk a little bit about China here. Uh, one thing we forget about China is that it's a communist country. And there's one thing I learned by being in the military during the Cold War, is that communist countries lie. So we don't really know how bad things are in China right now. I heard estimates that their actual GDP might be at least 2% below what they're saying it is. Well, that affects all the other emerging markets around China, who supply China. And we're seeing some issues. I believe that we're, we are getting ready for another round of uh, sovereign debt default in emerging markets, which happens once in a while, that's what I believe. And uh, I'm not sure if that, how this fits into the questions per se, but uh, we were talking about uh, single country credit risk. Um, so I think that that's, that is the risk in the marketplace right now. Maybe I've got a question. What was the question again? Or maybe just, maybe you can just pick up from that. <laughs> Question. No, I, I, think, uh, I wish the U.S. government and other governments weren't doing such deficit spending. Um, and I blame it on the Republicans, Democrats, Independents, and all the rest. Uh, with that said, you know, I'm not going to put everything in gold, um, guns, uh, so I, I don't know where else to, you know, invest. I do believe in a in a diversified global portfolio, I would invest in stocks in other planets if I knew how to do that. The cost would so low. Um, and, you know, I don't know the solution politically. I've never predicted anything right in my life in politics. Uh, but, you know, I, I hope there'll be some fiscal responsibility. That's all I can say. The things that eventually nail you won't be the things that you predict are the things that are obvious now. That's what history teaches us. And since you can't predict the future, you should diversify. Okay, this is sort of in the same vein. Uh, this is general foreign investing. Uh, for a long-term investor, if foreign investment could be held denominated in the native currency as opposed to the individual's home currency, would it be desirable to do so? I think we answered that. In, I think, if I'm hearing the question correctly, that in equities, I would not do a currency hedge. But if I were to do bonds, which I don't, then I would currency hedge. I like the additional currency volatility that comes from owning international stocks because it may not be correlated with the U.S. stock market. And if there is a collapse of the dollar, let's say, you, you're going to get the return um, of that foreign currency. It's not a prediction that I know one currency is going to do better. It's just an extra form of diversification. Volatility that's not correlated is a good thing. Yeah, I mean, there's good quantitative work that suggests that your currency exposure should be equal, your portfolio should be equal to your stock, your foreign stock exposure. Uh, and the default way of doing that, the way we almost all do it, is we own uh, the international stock index funds that we own that are non-hedged, all right? Uh, and then our domestic bonds are, 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 are hedged, and we own foreign bonds, they're hedged too. Now, if you think about it, there's no reason why you couldn't do it the opposite way around. If you have 20% of your portfolio that was in international stocks, you can hedge all of that and own 20% international bonds that aren't hedged because the dollars in your, the, the, the yen and the, 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 the euros in your portfolio, the English pounds in your portfolio, don't know whether they're in stocks or bonds when you look at your portfolio at the end of the day. But that's logistically much more difficult to do, so we don't do it the way we do it by default, which is these big international index funds that are, that are non-hedged, and we hopefully aren't investing in uh, unhedged international bonds. Okay, what is your guidance about buying municipal bonds versus CDs in taxable accounts? I mean, the CDs obviously are, are better off in the tax-deferred accounts, and for a duh, you, you don't want to own munis 
in your tax deferred account. You know, my own view, I think I've said this before, some of you are newer, but um, you know, munis represent about 10% of the investment grade market, uh, bond market. I wouldn't go more than, let's say, 2, 2.5x. And you know, my big concern is with 2 to 3 trillion of unfunded pension liabilities, and that's assuming 7.5% um, you know, returns for the, the pensions themselves. Uh, if Jack is right that stocks are in 4% and bonds are in 3% in 10 years, with all the baby boomers retiring and those pension and health care liabilities being paid out, there could be stress on the new market. So I, I wouldn't overweight it, and I am not Meredith Whitney. I don't look like Meredith Whitney. I'm very concerned that Meredith Whitney. Have. And the follow-up question for that is, uh, what risks should I be aware of when buying Vanguard's intermediate term tax exempt fund investors there? Liquidity risk in a crisis. So make sure that you're not depending on that money completely, which is why Alan recommends uh, you know, having it be not, not the, the lion's share of your taxable uh, portfolio. You're going to need that money sooner or later, and you don't want to have to take a haircut when you take it out. So you want to own some CDs and some treasuries. I actually take risk with stocks and with your bonds, mostly to be backed by the U.S. government. I, I like the uh, Vanguard Intermediate Term Municipal Bond Fund, and we use it all the time. Um, it's broadly diversified um, and high quality. And we tell people that this is your long-term investment portfolio, so if you need liquidity, you're probably better off taking a little bit of money and putting it into a Vanguard short-term municipal bond fund or a CD or put it in the bank. So other than just macro municipal risk, which by the way, I'm, municipal bonds are different than corporate bonds. Corporations can go out of business. Okay, states can't really go out of business. Cities can't really go out of business, although, you know, we're in Detroit, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but I mean, the, the credit quality rating of, of, of municipalities as they drop below investment grade are sold out of that portfolio. So, I'm very, very extremely low probability that something that's investment grade in, say, a Vanguard municipal bond fund is going to just default the next day. So, and again, you're talking about cities here where they restructure and you can't, a city just can't go out of business. So, um, it's a little different with even ratings, let's say, of a, of a city school district. If it's a, a single A rating, it's going to be a little different than a single A rating of a corporate bond because corporations go out of business, whereas a school you know, district can't go out of business. They can restructure debt. Yes, the GM is still a business. If you own stocks, you own zero. If you own bonds, you got five cents. But that's a corporation. It's not. A, it's not a municipality. No, no, it, it's exactly right. That even during the Great Depression, only a very small percent of municipalities default. It's not credit risk. You're worried about this temporary liquidity risk. And, and you should have other means for that. In other words. If you're doing it with an intermediate term municipal bond fund, that's more long term. So if you need immediate liquidity, you really should have an emergency fund to cover your six months or a year's worth of living expenses, and that could be in something else. In the Great Depression, though, with all due respect, there, there weren't tens of millions of baby boomers retiring. And I'm, I'm not saying it's going to happen. I'm saying that if stocks don't have a great next decade, if Jack Bogle is right on that, there could be some systemic stress. And there are leverage. They can raise taxes and people can move. In some states, they depends on the law, they can renegotiate what those um, liabilities to their employees are. Um, they can have the employees increase contributions. But you know, I wouldn't want to be the politician running you know, on a platform that I want to increase taxes and decrease services. Even for an investor who is 100% taxable, I would limit your exposure to union units to no more than 40 or 50 percent of your bond portfolio. And remember, if you live in a high tax state, you can buy treasuries and you don't have to pay state income tax on the income, interest income from treasuries. Okay, the next question is 
Is there an obsession in our culture with the number as opposed to a guaranteed yearly income such as Social Security pension or new income? And if so, why? Well, you know, you gotta you, you gotta buy that, you know, the, the, the guaranteed stream of income doesn't come for free. You gotta buy it. And to buy that you need a number. So it's not one or the other, it's it's you need both. Now, you know, you can make a point, it's a very good point, that you do have a certain amount of risk between the time you acquire the number and the time you buy that stream. You know, you defer the ability or you you know defer your social security or whatever, but that's the risk that's almost impossible to avoid. I think part of the reason there's such a focus on it is simply because our retirement system is overwhelmingly defined contribution plans these days, which you look at your statement and it doesn't tell you how much income that translates into, it just tells you how much money is sitting there. Um, I do think it's a mistake to focus on that so much and clearly, uh, I'm always thinking about Social Security, clearly that's one of the reasons why people are reluctant to spend down their portfolio to delay Social Security, even in cases when it's an overwhelmingly good deal to do so, is because they focused on this number for so long and watched it go up and up and up, and now the idea of watching it go down, even if what you're getting is an incredibly safe, very good deal of an income stream, they're still reluctant to do it. The paradigm that I like to use to, to, to display that is that imagine that Two, you know, a pair of twins, sixty-five-year-old retiree twins. One has got fifty thousand dollars of annual income and pensions that is COVID, that is inflation adjusted. The other has a million-dollar lump sum. All right, they're actually equivalent. All right, but who do you think is going to run out of money first? Who do you think is going to sleep better when he's he or she is seventy-eight years old? You know, for whatever reason, everyone in this room was programmed to live below their means and build up a nest egg. And, and we're different than a lot of other people. And doing so leads us to focus, we've been, spent our whole life building up that nest egg, we can't spend it down. So we concentrate too much on income. And of course, you know, lots of you know, brilliant funds like the Schwab Ultra Short, you know, safe alternative to a bond fund with zero volatility, just a free lunch until it lost half of its value. Um, you know, we, we keep making these same mistakes again. So I would focus more on what a safe spin down rate is. And I think if you play a perfect game, you know, portfolio of somewhere close to 50 50, um, a perfect gain is three and a half percent increasing with inflation, which of course you have to do to uh, keep your standard of living the same. But income is, is the biggest threat to people's retirement plans, and we are not efficient learners. The same mistakes that that we made in 2008, where the average bond fund lost eight percent, many bond funds lost fifty percent, total bond fund gained five point two percent. We're making. So, Alan, have you figured out how to have a prosperous retirement, but then have your funeral expense check bounce? <laughs> <laughs> yes, but it involves suicide, and I <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that just about concludes. <laughs> We can't talk about that one. Uh, let's give the panel uh, 